We hold these truths. A reverent review of the U.S. Constitution by Lawrence Patton MacDonald. Chapter 3. A New Constitution. Monday, May 14, 1787, was the day fixed for the meeting of the deputies in convention for revising the federal system of government. On that day, a small number only had assembled. Seven states were not convened till Friday, the 25th of May. The seven-man Virginia delegation, which consisted of George Washington, Edmund Randolph, John Blair, James Madison, George Mason, George Wythe, and James McClurg, arrived in Philadelphia on May 14th. Beginning on May 17th, this delegation, while awaiting the arrival of other state delegations, met every day for two or three hours, formulating a plan to propose when the convention began its work. When the gathering formally convened on May 25th, the convention by unanimous vote immediately chose George Washington to be its presiding officer. Having been conducted to the chair, Washington did what he had done on other momentous occasions. He lamented his want of better qualifications for the position. The convention then spent a few days electing other officers, appointing committees, and establishing its rules of procedure. On May 29, 1787, Edmund Randolph, the nominal head of the Virginia delegation, because he was governor of the state, opened the main business of the Constitutional Convention when he presented the Virginia plan. James Madison is believed to have written the proposals. The first resolve of the Virginia plan was that the Articles of Confederation ought to be so corrected and enlarged as to accomplish the objects proposed by their institution, namely common defense, security of liberty, and general welfare. In a speech explaining the broad purpose of the plan he was introducing, Randolph said the Articles of Confederation had left the states so much control over national affairs and had given the federal government so little power to perform its assigned functions that the Union was disintegrating and the nation was sliding into chaos. The expected controversy at the Constitutional Convention began almost at once. The convention adjourned at the close of Randolph's speech, but the next day, May 30th, Charles Pinckney of South Carolina wished to know of Mr. Randolph whether he meant to abolish the state governments altogether. Mr. Randolph replied that he meant by these general propositions merely to introduce the particular ones which explained the outlines of the system he had in view. The convention delegates were agreed that the new government must be given enough power to perform its assigned duties, as the first resolve of the Virginia plan said, and they knew that would require a lot of power. They objected to the general, undefined, and therefore unlimited power suggested by the Virginia plan to accomplish the common defense, security of liberty, and general welfare. They were not quibbling over definitions. Welfare did not even connote then what is one of its primary meanings in the United States today, that is, government giving tax money to individuals or private organizations. Just as providing for the common defense meant, to the Founding Fathers, defending all the states against foreign powers, so promoting the general welfare, meant defending states against domestic violence beyond their control, maintaining peace and harmony among them, and preventing state laws and restrictions from inhibiting citizens of their liberty to trade and travel freely throughout the nation. All convention delegates wanted a federal government that could accomplish these ends, but they wanted enumeration of the specific powers that the government could exercise toward those ends so that government agents themselves could never enlarge the meaning of common defense and general welfare to cover anything the agents might want to do. On May 30th and 31st, the two days following presentation of the Virginia plan, delegates badgered Randolph about the absence in his plan of specific powers, with the limitations on them clearly defined. 
Repeatedly, Randolph asserted that he too wanted such limitations and could not tolerate the idea of a federal government with indefinite powers. Aware of the deep waters they were getting into, James Wilson of Pennsylvania observed that it would be impossible to enumerate the powers which the federal legislature ought to have. Just before the close of business on May 31st, Madison recorded in his notes his own remarks to the convention on the subject of enumeration. Mr. Madison said that he had brought with him into the convention a strong bias in favor of an enumeration and definition of the powers necessary to be exercised by the national legislature, but had also brought doubts concerning its practicability. His wishes remained unaltered, but his doubts had become stronger. What his opinion might ultimately be, he could not yet tell, but he should shrink from nothing which should be found essential to such a form of government as would provide for the safety, liberty, and happiness of the community. Was it practical to write a constitution listing in details all powers which government should have for all times and all occasions? At any given moment in history, it may be unnecessary and dangerous for a government agency to engage in activity which might become at a later time a proper and necessary function of government. In a complex and growing society, some governmental power must be flexible, broad, and general. This was the convention's thorniest problem, and it was the first the delegates addressed. The framers handled it by establishing our unique federal system. They created a federal government and then tied it down with detailed specifications of what it could and could not do. The flexible powers of government, those that could be stretched to authorize governmental activities deemed necessary to meet changing needs of changing times, were left with the states. Some state governments like all other governments in history, would doubtless misuse their broad powers on occasion and thus abuse their people. But since the states were bound together in union by a constitution which gave their citizens a common national citizenship and which would not let states interfere with the liberty of citizens to travel and trade freely across state lines, there would be a restraining and corrective force on such misuse of power by the states. If a state government went too far, or not far enough, in the use of its undefined powers, it would lose productive citizens and important businesses and other private organizations to other states. Experience and competition among the states would eventually force correction of the worst abuse and excesses by state governments. If the federal government were given broad powers to make such social and political experiments at the discretion of federal officials, it would become a dictatorship, a political and economic colossus usurping powers of the states under the pretext of giving them aid, robbing and enslaving the people under the pretext of taking care of them. There would be no competitive force, as among the states, to restrain or correct the tyranny and follies of the federal government because its power would be imposed on the whole nation uniformly. There would be no neighboring state to which the citizens could escape. The American federal system gave the United States something extraordinary, a way for the people without endangering the liberties of their entire nation to experiment with social controls and political regulation of business activity. Here and only here, was a reasonably safe means by which people could find out through trial and error just how far governments should be permitted to intervene in the private affairs of their citizens. Deciding upon the broad plan was difficult. Putting in the specifications required extraordinary intelligence, statesmanship, and perseverance. In the old confederation, states had equal representation in the National Congress. The combined population of small states was far less than the combined population of large states, yet there were more small states than large ones. This gave a minority living in small states control in the handling of national affairs over a majority 
living in large states. Yet, if states were given representation on the basis of population, the minority populations in the small states would be overwhelmed by the majority in big states. Thus, small states would have no effective voice in national affairs. The framers solved this problem by dividing federal power into three branches. One was the judicial branch, weak and with very limited functions. Its presiding officials would be selected by the other two branches and subjected to almost total control by them. The strongest branch of the federal government, the Legislative Congress, was divided into two chambers, a House and Senate. The stronger of these two was the House. Its members would be selected directly by qualified voters in each state. In the House, states were given representation proportionate to their population, except that every state, no matter how small, would have at least one representative. Senators were chosen in the states by state legislatures in any manner chosen by those state legislators. Senators were chosen in the states by state legislatures in any manner chosen by those legislatures, but not by direct vote of the people. All states had equal representation in the Senate, two senators each. The chief official of the executive branch, the president, was not to be elected by direct vote of the people, but was to be chosen by the state legislatures through an indirect method which came to be called the electoral college system. Once every four years, each state legislature would appoint in any manner it pleased electors to serve in its electoral college, the number of electors equaling the number of senators and representatives the state had in the U.S. Congress. The sole function of the Electoral College, as prescribed in the original Constitution and modified by the Twelfth Amendment of 1804, was to cast two votes, one for a president, the other for a vice president of the United States. Such votes would be cast within the state on a specific day. The Electoral College would then automatically go out of existence. Electors would not even travel outside their own state. Their votes were transmitted to Congress, where they were counted together with the Electoral College votes from all other states. The person receiving a majority of all Electoral College votes for president was elected, and so also with regard to the vice president. Thus, the power of each state in choosing a president and a vice president was exactly equal to its power in choosing members of Congress. It is the most nearly perfect system ever devised for the equitable distribution of power among governmental units of differing sizes. The provision that each state must have at least one member in the House did give the smallest states a slight advantage. A state with a population large enough so that it had four members in the House would have twice as much representation, two senators plus four representatives, and the whole Congress, as a small state with only one member in the House and two senators. But the big state might have a population ten times larger than the small state or even more. No large state delegate mentioned a one-man vote principle as a requirement for a representative government. Large states accepted the unavoidable disadvantage, but that still left major problems. The Constitution requires the federal government to guarantee to the people in every state a Republican form of government. That would prevent a cabal in any state from seizing power and manipulating electoral and other governmental processes so that the people no longer had a free Republican form of government. This guarantee was readily accepted by the delegates, but it raised other questions. Since the federal government had the obligation to guarantee a republican form of government in every state, should it be given any supervisory power over state elections? The answer of the convention was an emphatic no.
The right to determine voter qualifications is the most crucial attribute of sovereignty, and states were to be left with almost complete sovereignty in the handling of their internal affairs. The federal government was prohibited from interfering with the setting of voter qualifications or the performance of any other function in the state elections. It is clear, in the language of the Constitution itself, that the framers wanted to leave the states with total control of even federal elections held within the states, but they dared not. They did leave the states the inviolable right to determine voter qualifications for participation in federal elections, provided only that the qualifications be the same as those set for comparable state elections. The Constitution specifically grants states the power to arrange and manage federal elections, but gives Congress a veto over that power. The constitutional provision that U.S. Senators be selected by state legislatures rather than by direct vote of the people had several purposes. The main purpose was to provide the state governments themselves with some direct influence on federal power by allowing them through their appointed senators, some indirect participation in federal legislative activity. Chaining the federal government down with exact specifications was not a simple matter either. In a constitution intended as fundamental law for all time, it would be absurd to stipulate that Congress could tax only a certain amount for any of the specified functions because the amount needed was sure to change. Tax revenues sufficient to maintain an American Navy in 1787 might be woefully inadequate 200 years later. The Constitutional Convention solved this problem by giving Congress vast power to tax, but tied Congress down by carefully specifying the kinds of functions it was empowered to use tax money for. The clause Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes to provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States, was intended to denote the specific types of functions Congress may finance with tax money, defending the nation and maintaining peace and harmony among the states. If the Constitution does not give the federal government power to perform a particular type of activity, the government cannot legally perform it, as the Bill of Rights makes clear. Here are the basic powers the Constitution gives to the executive or legislative branches of the federal government to borrow money, to coin money, regulate its value, and punish counterfeiting, to handle all foreign affairs, including commercial relations and crimes committed on the high seas against Americans or their property, to handle all affairs with American Indian tribes, to defend the nation against foreign powers, to exercise concurrent jurisdiction with states in organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, to govern the militia when called into national service, to enforce national laws, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions, to assist the states when called upon in suppressing domestic violence, to prevent the states from erecting barriers to the free flow of commerce and people across state lines, to guarantee that each state give full faith and credit to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state, to guarantee a republican form of government to all states, to admit new states to the Union, to guarantee a common national citizenship to all citizens of every state, to handle all matters involved in the admission of aliens to the country and the granting of citizenship to them, to fix the standard of weights and measures used throughout the nation, to establish uniform bankruptcy laws, to enact copyright laws, to establish post offices and post roads, to govern the territories of the Union not organized into states, including the District of Columbia, to administer all lands and other property owned by the United States, and to propose amendments to the Constitution. All these enumerated powers, but no others, the federal government was granted 
for the broad purpose of providing for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. It is significant that some of the enumerated powers limiting the overall power of the federal government by the fact of being enumerated also contain phrases which limit federal power within the particular area being specified. In dividing the federal government into three branches, the framers of the Constitution not only created a means of balancing state power against federal power, but also a way to divide and balance federal power against itself. They knew the intrinsic nature of government. Power is its essential ingredient and love of power, the primary motivation of governing officials. They were giving the federal government great power and then attempted to chain it down by telling it what it could and could not do. But what if it disobeyed? The Constitution makes the three branches separate but not independent. It provides overlapping responsibilities for all branches and gives special prerogatives to each. This makes them rivals, each jealous of its own power. Each branch has the means to inhibit, if not prevent, the actions of the others. This rivalry was deliberately created and it was intended to act as a restraint to keep any of the three branches from disobeying the Constitution. The president, as chief executive, has important responsibilities assigned to him and he plays an important role in the responsibilities assigned to Congress. With the veto, the president can impede and even embarrass Congress. He can delay it, if not stop it altogether from making unwise or unconstitutional laws. The Congress, the legislative branch, has even greater responsibilities assigned to it and it has a hand in exercising or controlling the most important powers assigned to the president. The president's power to use the armed forces as commander-in-chief is broad because it is unspecified, but only Congress can raise and support armies or provide and maintain a navy or declare war. If the president does anything which violates the Constitution, Congress can stop him completely by cutting off the tax money. The Constitution empowers the President to appoint federal judges, ambassadors, and other high officials of government and to make treaties with foreign nations, but only with the advice and consent of the Senate. The judicial power of the United States is vested in the Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress may create, and the judicial power extends to certain enumerated types of cases. The Supreme Court has original jurisdiction, that is, can try matters without going through lower courts in only two types of cases. Number one, cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, and number two, those in which a state shall be party. In all other categories of cases within the judicial power, the Supreme Court has only appellate jurisdiction that is, it can hear disputes only on appeal from lower courts. Moreover, its appellate jurisdiction is subject to such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. Thus, Congress can keep the Supreme Court from having any very meaningful jurisdiction, and it can even abolish all lower federal courts. The Supreme Court's power to decide matters properly before it is inherent in the constitutional provision which vests it with the judicial power of the United States. Also inherent in the entire Constitution, though not expressly stated, is the ancient principle that the intent of the lawgiver is the law. A written Constitution would be an absurdity and a nullity if that principle were not inherent in it. If a judge can interpret the Constitution or laws to mean something obviously not intended by the original makers, if he can decide that the Constitution does not mean today what it meant yesterday, and if his ruling becomes binding upon the nation, then the nation's Constitution and laws are meaningless. If judges can reinterpret the law whenever they wish to make it more suitable for some contemporary conditions, 
with them determining what this suitability is, then the nation is ruled by judicial despots, not by law. In adjudicating a controversy to determine whether some act of the Congress or of the President or of both violates the Constitution, the Supreme Court has a limited function. It should measure the act in question against all the grants of power which the Constitution made to the President and to Congress. If the court then thinks the act puts uh, the federal government in the role of exercising some power which the framers of the Constitution did not clearly intend the federal government to have, the court should say so whether or not the court approves of what the federal government is trying to do. That is all the Supreme Court legally can do. It does not have constitutionally granted power to make Congress and the President refrain from doing something which the court has declared to be unconstitutional. Only the force of public opinion can do that. So far, that force has been adequate. Only once has a President, Andrew Jackson, said, in effect, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court has made his decision. Now let's see him enforce it. The decision involved Indian affairs on the frontier, a matter of little interest to the general public at that time. If the Supreme Court makes a decision or does anything else which is unconstitutional, Congress can so limit its jurisdiction that the court could have nothing to do but hear and decide cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls, and those in which a state shall be party. Congress can also impeach any federal judge or the president for constitutional violations falling within the types of impeachable offenses specified in the Constitution. Dividing federal power into three rival but interdependent branches was an ingenious balancing of power against power to keep power from concentrating, but it was not enough to allay the Founding Fathers' fear of too much power in one place. The Congress was unquestionably the strongest of the three branches. It could render the President ineffective by refusing to appropriate tax money for his activities, and it could reduce the Supreme Court to impotence. Neither of the other branches, nor both together, had similar power over Congress. The need to inhibit Congressional power from being too easily or too quickly used for unconstitutional or unwise purposes was one of the reasons for dividing the legislative branch into two chambers balancing the legislative power against itself. The two chambers have a concurrent legislative role, but they are rivals for recognition in that role, and each has special functions. The other is denied. The Senate has exclusive power to ratify or reject appointments and treaties made by the presidency. The House has exclusive power to initiate taxing laws. This, then, was the original constitutional system. Within the states, people were free to use and redistribute the vast political power left with them and to alter the functions of their state governments in any way and as often as they liked under provisions which they themselves established, so long as they did nothing that conflicted with the fundamental law of the whole land, the Constitution. But this overall contract between the people and their federal government, the Constitution, was rigidly fixed for all time by the intent of the original lawgivers who wrote it. Even the procedures governing changes in that contract, amendment to the Constitution, were carefully spelled out. It would have been preposterous to authorize federal officials hired to perform functions specified by the contract also to act as lawgivers empowered to change that contract. The federal officials conceivably could be power-hungry, venal politicians cunning enough to excite the public into accepting temporarily that their reforms would benefit the public when their real motive was simply a lust for more power. The framers provided means for the people to amend the Constitution, means which virtually circumvent 
federal officials. The president and the federal courts are given no role whatever in the amendment process. Congress is authorized to propose constitutional amendments if it pleases. It is obligated to call a special convention to propose constitutional amendments if two-thirds of all state legislatures demand that it do so, but Congress is given no hand in the actual ratifying or rejecting of proposed amendments. The amendment process is slow and it was made so deliberately. In making changes in their organic law, people should not be stampeded by demagoguery, mob psychology or false promises. The public should have ample time to think, study, debate and reflect before making constitutional changes that affect all of them and their posterity. As James Madison put it, the amendment process was designed specifically to guard against that extreme facility which would render the Constitution too mutable. Most governmental power over the multitudinous private and business activities of the people had been left in the states. State power was balancing against state power and also against federal power. Federal power was divided into three branches and thus balanced against itself. The most federal power was lodged in the legislative branch, but there it was subdivided into two chambers and balanced against itself. None of the Founding Fathers thought the system they had devised was perfect, but it was the best they could do. They believed it would work exactly as they intended, because they had made their intent very clear all that was needed to determine what was meant by a certain phrase or clause was to apply what Alexander Hamilton called the unsophisticated dictates of common sense. The Founding Fathers knew there would always be federal officials trying to give themselves more power by twisting and torturing constitutional provisions far beyond their original intent, and they knew that there would always be powerful special interest forces inciting temporary public support for such illegal distorting of the federal charter. The framers hoped and believed that the rivalries and balances of power they had established would frustrate such efforts. But in the end, whether the system actually operated as established would really depend on the people. Would they remain vigilant and sufficiently well informed, themselves using unsophisticated common sense about what the federal government can legally do to make their federal officials obey the fundamental law of the nation. None of the framers of the Constitution really revealed how they felt about that question, but Benjamin Franklin gave a hint of his own feelings. As Franklin was leaving the building where, after four months of hard work, the Constitution had at last been completed and signed. A lady asked him what kind of government the Convention had created. Very old, very tired, and very wise, Benjamin Franklin replied, A republic, if you can keep it. <laughs>